Now Fiddler. Puts on the step, goes right through, puts on the step again. Oh, go pretty. That was magnificent stuff. Well, they shall not really them. Marshalls gets away, Marshalls gets away. Marshalls still going. Mullins opens up again. Oh, look at him go. He beats O'Davis on the outside. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Voluntary Tackle, the only NRL podcast that, like the halves pairing of the Panthers, dressed as Colonel Sanders for the Daly M's as a homage to Manly looking cooked on the weekend. Dirty bird, respect dirty bird. We are pre-recording this loosely defined excuse of a podcast live from across this to our state of Wales. I am host Big T of whom views are my own and these said views are done with an air of confidence and confidence inside a Big T's T. And while floating lovingly on the dreamboat that is Campbell Murray and his partner, Miranda Cross. On today's show, Reese Walsh charged with behaving like a handsome and well-paid 19-year-old on the Gold Coast. Big T steals perfectly worded Batuta headline gags. Nathan Cleary able to kick and tackle as he pleases. Did the Storm finally miss Cameron the Goat Smith? And we also discuss all things Grand Final E. But first, a man who is more of a loaded, uh, sorry, more of a Lord of the Fries guy than a KFC bloke. Please welcome Xander Rizzo Rosado. Good to be with you guys. Missed you the last couple of weeks. Rizzo, what's your uh, dirty, disgraceful fast food place of choice? Yeah, I don't really have a, a, a fast food place of choice so much. It's just not really my go. I, but I will will enjoy some really unhealthy food uh, from time to time. So I don't I don't mind having you know a, a nice thick chicken fillet with brie cheese and bacon wrapped in it. But I prefer to make it myself rather than you know have the garbage that's dished out at most fast food places. Wow, that's the most. Eastern suburbs answer you could have given. Now, do you know? Do you know like, I don't know if you're playing up the stereotype. Do you, do you know what Lord of the Fries is, by the way? Do you know what that chain is? I've heard of it. Yeah, but I, I just had to get the word brie cheese into into my um into my uh, my, yeah. my fast food. I was trying, trying to think yeah. of something in the break um, after we had our second chance, and I just wanted to think of something that sounded Eastern suburbs. Um, okay, well, I can tell you that Lord of the Fries is it looks to be a um, fun kind of kitsch uh r&b vibey hot dog place but everything inside is vegan and so that's why i thought it might be on your vibe speaking no, I'm, of I'm, I'm a and- hardcore carnivore so you, you I, I couldn't wouldn't be seen in a vegan place to save your life oh but just it's pretty cool and like hip which is why <laughs> i thought maybe it was in these and so but speaking of dirty and disgraceful next is a man who is more of a rural eagle boys man Welcome, Media Watch, Mazo Mario. Good evening. <coughs> well, that sounded great. How are you going? <laughs> yeah, 20, 25 minutes to clear your throat and your chairs right then. Uh, now, Eagle Boys, that's that's a cute reference, right? Like Eagle Boys is very rural New South Wales, or, do, or did they never get out that far for you? Uh, we, we did have an Eagle Boys out in the Good. back ass end of nowhere here, but of course it died because it was around <laughs> the corner from KFC, and that's where everyone wanted to go. Okay, and what is your lazy and humiliating fast food of choice? Oh, KFC every day, and I'm not—I'm not humiliated by it at all. I'm proud, loud and proud KFC fan. Well, of course, I only use those adjectives so I could segue to this bit. Speaking of lazy and humiliating, finally we have a man who is more of a late-night servo sushi kind of guy. Welcome, at your host and mine, Eamon Bizzo Brown. Thank you, T. Wonderful to be here as always. <laughs> what is your fuck that foul food of love? Mate, I guess my uh, joy was when Sizzler was a thing. Ooh. I used to love the all-you-can-eat buffet, and I particularly loved deliberately putting my cock in the soft serve <laughs> um, just to kind of make sure that no one else could enjoy the dessert bar. And I, it was sort of like marking my territory. Like, no one would go near it once I'd, I'd put my penis in it. So, yeah, they were the good old days. The coldest thing that they served. You put your dick in the coldest thing that they could <laughs> serve. Yeah, but the warm caro one they store, surely. Anyway. Well, look, uh, not that I not that I fully thought out how to fuck different parts of a Bay Marie, but sure. I just wouldn't have probably gone to wouldn't have gone to the soft serve. I would have thought that you were making soft serve, or maybe that's what happens. You end up hiding it in there. No, it makes sense to me now. Well, let me start the official part of our show in typical Xander Risotto fashion, where I do a big "I told you so" because it's Benji Marshall's comp, and we're all just passengers. It wasn't going to be Mar- It wasn't going to be Manly that won. Amen at Bizzo Brown. I will ask you this though: Are Melbourne fucked next year? If they happen to have a bad run of injuries or poor form, they'll just rot the cap. So I feel as though they've always got a backup plan of some sort. Um, yeah. you know, that reminds me of another team this year. 
had a lot of injuries, rotted the cap. I can't, I can't <laughs> put my finger on it. But no, True. Melbourne Storm, they, they sort of the, I guess, the equivalent of the uh, small child who desperately wants to win the game of Monopoly when they're about 11 years old, is if, you know, for whatever reason, they haven't been able to obtain Park Lane and Mayfair, they'll just steal from the bank and throw the board in the air. And Media Watch, speaking of absolutely hating Melbourne, how did you see Melbourne on the weekend? They played like shit. Um, they just dropped the ball too much it was the main thing. I, they, To me, they looked panicked. They looked like Manly did against Melbourne. They just really, every time they got the ball, they were trying to play catch-up footy when they really didn't need to. They were, you know, they were never far behind, but they played like they were down by 14 or something. It was kind of strange. It was not really like them, but I'm... Not, I'm not going with any any suggestion that it's because no Cam Smith because they choked plenty of times with him there. Hello, and I also couldn't help calling him Cam the Goat Smith just to us see if you were going to say something during the, the monologue. Now, Risotto, did you get a chance between wine tasting and Wallaby wins to see either of the games, the <laughs> NRL games on the weekend? Yeah, I watched it all, mate. I, I just uh, I just scheduled it. The only thing I didn't watch was the AFL, um, which uh, you know I wasn't planning on anyway, but I just thought I'd. Uh, mentioned that in passing. Yeah, I was I was really impressed with the Penrith win. Uh, obviously, um, the Storm did suffer a fair bit just from basically being reduced to what a two man bench pretty early in the game. Um, and you know, on balance, I think that was probably where the difference was. They they just they missed a little bit of um, that Brandon Smith dynamism at dummy half. You know, the go forward through the middle. And yeah, I think you're right that. They panicked a bit. It reminded me a lot of watching the game they played against the Eels, where they were going for 20 straight. And they, were, they looked like almost as if the occasion got to them a little bit. They were pushing a few too many passes and and just not quite as composed as we're used to seeing them. And it's interesting you, you mentioned Brandon Smith because he yeah. um, was just named Dally M Hooker of the Year. But Mario was also telling him he's been hooking into something else recently. Oh, allegedly, no, no proof allegedly. and everything. But yes, the interesting video going around today that I did see um, earlier on today and then shared with you guys a little bit later just to show you so you could see what people were talking about. In my opinion, like, yeah, we can see what they're allegedly doing, but there's absolutely no, the, the video doesn't prove anything. I'm not going to go into particular detail on the air, but if people, you know, I think most people have probably seen it by now anyway, it's, that I don't think there'll be any trouble from this at all. If Reese Walsh came out and admitted it, these guys, are, they're storm players. They're smart enough not to admit it. They're just going to say, you know, not we were just, you know, it was whiz fizz. It was sherbet. Fuck off. You're not leaving much to the imagination there, Mark. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm, enjoying the I'm not going like, to talk about the let's, details. Let's not tell. <laughs> all right. No detail. If, anyone, if anyone's keen to see the video, Mario, I'm sure, will send it to you by DMs. Although he did not create the video. He has no idea where it came from. His lawyers. I, uh, you know, happy to call you there in the mail. Uh, and and talk me through South as well while you're there, Rosado. That was pretty disappointing for Manly. I thought they just they played they played like we did against Manly. Um, just way too many way too many errors. There they was certainly a chance there, but their completion rate just completely killed them. And you know, um, then I think it was really R- Reynolds' kicking game and errors at the back that um, finished them off. I think South's middle forwards were the difference. Um, that and control and uh mario can you talk us through manly's capitulation um i don't see it as a capitulation particularly we could have played better than we did um we had two tries that we certainly should have turned into points taken away from us i'm not complaining about the decisions by any stretch i'm just i'm sad that we didn't convert those into points and south's had two tries scored off some pretty bloody lucky kicks when you think when you really look at it, they played better than us. They had more ball than us, which helped them play better than us. And, you know, next year we're better than Souths. And for their sake, I hope they win this year. Good luck to them. One of the kicks I want to talk us through, where it's the old beware the second kick. I don't know if that's a Joey um, thing or a, a field goal thing, but beware the second kick's one of my favourites. Ball goes up, comes back, somehow ends up in in Cook's hands. And I just love that Cookie would, or, or Bis- I wouldn't know, what's his nickname? Cupcake would make his way over there. And then breaks a tackle because he's the fastest man in sand. And then trying to find the play, uh, runs back in field. And by then, Cody Walker, who, by the way, was down because he was hit late or about 35, 40 metres out, has picked himself up, ran the length left on that field into a gap. And then Cookies would have kicked through. And Damien Cook is a right-footed kicker, but puts that pinpoint incredible curve kick on with his left 
which bounces up beautifully to Cody Walker. So the luckiness is in the bounce, but everything else is just pure determination oh, sure. and and not giving up on the play. Oh, and I'm not talking you down. I'm just uh, overawed by that try still. I think about it before I go to bed the last few nights in a row. Yeah. I'm pretending the Benji Marshall's whis- whispering the uh, commentary in my ear, but it's um it's a real time. That, that, those those things really made me feel like even if Manly came back, there's just too much momentum or Daly Messenger of the Gods of Rugby really, really wanted South to make that grand final. When when did you feel like it was done, Mario? Oh, so I, I, at the third try, I thought we were pretty much gone when they scored that third try. It just looked a bit too far for us to come back because we, I think, oh, did we? I think we bombed our second try just before they scored their third, and that was that was the real hard one when Tommy dropped that ball when he should have just passed it. But you know, he's it, he's just not dropped that all year, and he's always gotten that down all year so you understand why he went for it himself he's gotten used to being the man um but you know that that felt like that bomb try was certainly the the kick in the guts but then the 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 dagger in the heart was the try to south not long after it getting him to 18 and after that it all felt like you know we got a few consolation tries let's be real moses sully um was Friggin' terrible. Good luck, Dragons. And then he gets a few Nofaluma tries at, you know, little runs at the end. You will find some souls. I mean, you just said then that he was the man of the year, and, and that's understandable. He was the fullback of the year and has just officially been named the Dalian player of the year. So that's exciting for you in some respects and Tom for his future prospects. But look, I would call it somewhat of a capitulation. And, and speaking of capitulations, did you see Reese Walsh's blow his chance of getting Rookie of the Year, Eamon? And I do mean blow in the lamest pun sense. It did strike me. He was picked up on the Gold Coast. And as far as I did a bit of um, case law a couple of years ago, I'm pretty sure it's actually mandatory to have Coke in your pocket if you're in the gold po- <laughs> on the Gold Coast. So um, I don't think he's got anything legally to worry about. Honestly, probably a little bit more annoyed at him if he was caught with a cascade light. <laughs> Did you want to wait? I know, Risotto, that you're probably the podcast expert on, on Coke, um, considering where you are. Did you have any insights on this? Yeah, I made, <clears throat> I made my thoughts um, pretty clear on, on Twitter about this, but um, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. I think, um, I think Eamon's right about it, the, the, uh, the place he's, he's in at the Gold Coast. Um, but, you know, bluntly, um, when you... When you look at society broadly, it is a wash, unfortunately. Like, I mean, I've worked in my student days in hospitals and known of doctors who have, you know, been known to have had cocaine habits and still operating so they didn't lose their jobs. Um, you know, the financial services and property development is a wash with this stuff. Um, right. You know, they're all known to be on the stuff. They're dusted to the eyeballs. I mean, it burns your dopamine receptors out and basically turns you into a drone by the time you're 60. But, hey, people. You- got the money i suppose people are happy enough to to do that and live uh, hard and fast and you know just fuck their brains but you know <laughs> all power to them Sander, do, you, do you think that reese walsh just needs a mentor i believe michael gordon's going free at the moment <laughs> oh for old mick gordon they got all good old flash again gold coast though right like i mean maybe it's maybe it's just part of the scene up there more than the other clubs but uh i think a mentor is probably something that he could use i mean 19 and earning half a million dollars a year it's it's a combination that'll that'll open up a few of these sorts of risks. Now, speaking of opening up risks, Sam Walker obviously already won the rookie thing, but do you think he was? Do you think he has an opportunity to grow, or do you think maybe that was a bit too early for him uh, in his season or in his career was it to put him into this much football? I don't think the evidence um, suggests that he he carved this year. I mean, he was thrust into the limelight probably earlier than Robinson would have wanted. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, he, he took every chance he was given with both hands, you know, on balance, uh, the, like him, him, uh, being the starter, uh, in some of those really big games was, was probably too much of an ask just given he's still developing, but, um, I don't think it was too early. I think he's just, he just needs to be, uh, used in the right way. If that makes sense. Yeah. I'm more like in terms of a whole long career is, would you see an issue with, with starting your career? 17, 18 in, in top grade as, as problematic when you want to try it. Will we now play into our mid thirties? Is starting this early problematic for his entire career? Physically, you, you mean? Yeah, and mentally. Like people get, you know, it can be really draining to do this job over and over and over again. And for a half, you're almost need to mature. Um, and I'm, I'm just concerned that halves starting this early might be problematic. Fullbacks or, uh, yeah. or second rows are another problem. But for some reason, I get nervous when halfbacks start this early. 
there, there's precedent. There, you obviously can burn people out, but I think it's it's a matter of how they're managed. Now, I think Robinson managed him this year and, and didn't didn't overload him. And you know, by using him off the bench and those as kind of like you know a utility impact player, he made sure that I think that workload was managed. But you know, you look at you look at some of the greats like Brad Pittler, one of the youngest True. you know um, uh, players to to make first grade, um, and his best years were his. Um, uh, his latter years, you know, he he actually became a much better half, um, much better half five eight, um, kind of in the last couple of years of his career, really. Yeah, but he was a centre so, for yeah. the first five or so years when he um, was playing in Penrith and things like that. But, but, but I mean, you're right. That's still a good point. I was just, I was just co- conscious of that. Maybe I'm just very nervous for another Luke Brooks kind of vibe, where you know, maybe that's one of the things that's happened to Luke, where he's he's just had so much. So many issues for so long, it's hard to work out which issue he needs to work on. Or, um, and you know, that doesn't mean that'll happen to Sam Walker. He seems to have a beautiful rainbow ball and, and was able to slot that field goal, you know, without all of that pressure there. So that's that's great. Um, Mario, you love a narrative. Did uh, did Reese Walsh ruin it with this coke vibe? Uh, I mean, hadn't it already? I don't think so, honestly. I mean, who cares? I, I don't. The, all of this this stuff, I just. Maybe it's just me. I just don't give a shit about players doing cocaine. I just don't care at all. Like, they're yeah, not doing, I think that's fair. Like, they're is not doing your, ice. That... They're not doing heroin. They're not doing performance enhancing drugs. Like, just fuck off with this shit. Let them smoke pot. Let them do blow. Just, you know, it's off in the off season and stuff. Go nuts. Yeah. I mean, are you in the same vibe, do you think? And I am actually. I mean, I think you know, outside of the NRL, even I'm I'm an advocate for legalising drugs by and large. And as Mario, I guess that's the term. Are they performance enhancing? That's where I draw the line. I'd say that if you you're a smacky, um, I'd say you're not going to turn up each weekend. Um, <laughs> so that, that may not be a great thing for your career. Uh, look, I just wanted to touch on as well, Sam Walker, just to give you your two cents. Look, oh, without bias, he is such a special player. Um, you know, it's interesting you were talking about Brad Fittler when he played his best years. I mean, I've always been of the opinion if in the halves, you, you know, the halves doesn't don't really mature until they're in their late 20s, early 30s. I feel like that's when, barring injury, they're at the peak of their powers. If this kid's doing this at 18, and, and Nathan Cleary was the same, um, he was doing pretty special things. That's true. That's true. Age, you know, he's just a very rare commodity, I think is the truth. And look, I'm just really excited, not just as a Roosters fan, but as an NRL fan to see what that kid can do because, you know, he's got nerves of steel already. Um, in key moments, which is a kind of a rare thing for a kid to have. Um, he's got good footwork. He's got more than just the rainbow pass. You know, he's got a hell of a lot of football IQ for an 18-year-old. And I'm I'm really interested to see what he'll be doing at his peak. You know, when he's 27, 28, he might be doing things we haven't seen yet. No, that's fair. And Nathan Clear is a fantastic example. He started really young. He had a huge amount of pressure and he's just gotten better and better slowly. Um, as well, so that's that's a good point. But just remember, you can debut too late too. Uh, big shout out to Hutch, who started at forty five. Well, we're all kind of agreeing, and and Rizzo, I didn't really get you to talk about it, but I think it's the same vibe. Is that culturally, uh, uh, we all feel okay about particular drugs, and if our friends were doing pot or coke, we wouldn't tell them necessarily to stop, although that might be the, not the life choice we're taking at the time. But then other ones like I saw heroin or weird things like that that we might be like, hey man, I'm not sure that's cool. We would probably also then draw a line with footballers. Can I, is that the consensus we've got? I yeah, broadly agree with that. I, I, like the other guy said, I mean, it's not a performance enhancing drug. Um, you know, there have been conventions if it's caught in your system. I think Wendell Saylor copped a two-year ban from all football back in mid-2000s for being caught with cocaine in his system, which I thought was ridiculous at the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, broadly, the ubiquitousness of some of this stuff and cocaine in particular, the circles it runs in, they probably should just legalise it and tax it. This is essentially a party drug, right? It sort of goes yeah. hand in hand with, with people having booze these days. It's just, it feels almost as common. So to penalise, for example, I, I agree with you, Xander, I think back to that Wendell Saylor um, penalty all the time. I think he got two years out of the game, didn't he, for that? Yeah, I mean, yeah he did. That's incredible. I mean, the NRL have let people back in sooner than that who have glassed their partners in the face. Yeah. I mean, it's mm. pretty crazy. That was a that was a um, SADA ruling rather than an NRL one. So he that was he he was at the Waratahs and he was banned from all football codes because he wanted to go to league, but this they were all signed up to a SADA so that no one could sign him. And now, Mario, speaking of narratives, how are you taking kicking T Gate with uh, Nathan Cleary? Um, I hate to say this, 
but because I was away all weekend on, you know, mostly out of internet, I missed this one. I watched the game, but I had no idea what you're talking about. Basically, uh, the second try that Penrith scored, it was it was more or less uh, right on um, the corner post. And uh, Cleary took the conversion probably about six metres uh, in from the sideline to give himself a bit of an advantage. Still missed the kick. The irony was, so everyone's, everyone's showing basically images on Twitter of the ball being put down just near the corner post and then, you know, Cleary taking the, click, uh, the kick closer to that uh, white line about five metres out blowing up about the advantage that he got. The funny thing is, though, that Cleary missed and he pushed it to the right. So actually, if he kicked it um, from uh, the spot where the ball was put down, he probably gets a conversion. But, um, yeah, it feels more like a, an oversight than anything. I feel like there's a David Hunter hypothetical podcast in that one. <laughs> we, we, we have seen that happen. I, I re- recall that being a, I don't remember exactly what the incident was, but I certainly recall that being a thing a few times in the past. And... How it happens is ridiculous, honestly. I mean, that's such a simple thing. Somebody's not doing their job. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't think, look, any suggestion that Cleary didn't know, like if it was a metre, sure. But if you're you're seriously that it was about six metres, he knew exactly what he was doing. He just figured I'll try it and see if they'll pull me up on it. Good on him. Mm. I don't think it's worth controversy. Like that's just, you know, NRL refs, church judges, do your fucking job. I totally agree. I think it's gamesmanship. If the the player will always try to take some advantage, if the refs are failing down in their uh, failing in their base duty um, to not get uh, a seven meter, I think it was the difference between where the ball was put oh. down and where he took the conversion. That's that is a fairly elementary error. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of unnecessary scrutiny that go the referee's way, but that is a pretty basic failing, I think. Uh, maybe it's not on the touch judges because they're stuck behind the goals, but they certainly, before they go behind the goals to receive, to judge the kick, they can, you know, the touch judge who was on that side can mark, you know, this is where it was. This is where you're taking it from. And the ref sees that and says, oh, off you go. That, that's just so straightforward. I mean, they're, they're watching the replay six, seven times. The bunker should be just paying attention to that. Yeah. We've confirmed this try was scored, you know, 47 centimetres from the sideline. It's just simple. It shouldn't even be needed to be said. But yeah. to be to miss by that much, no one's going to care that much about a metre, but for it to be that much, that's that's hilarious, honestly. I've just looked it up, fellas. Um, officially, it was over 4.5 metres advantage, or to put it another way, a Nathan Cleary chin length. So it was, it's a fair <laughs> advantage that he got. Well, I mean, Murray, you've absolutely nailed what the process is. is that when someone scores, the touch judges go into the end goal to signify that they agree that they what they've seen as a try. Referee blows at the point, and the closest touch judge runs and, and takes that mark. The referee then runs out into the field, uh, you know, in a in a proximity where the guy will kick it. Turns around and nods to say, "Yep, yeah, great, I've got I've got the mark." And then that touch judge joins the other touch judge behind the goal post. Go. Okay. Now, there's a very good chance that 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 happened like normal, but. What may have also then ensued is that the referee's taken the mark. Nathan's got over there to, to start putting his tee down. And the referee then getting water or something else has moved to a particular side. And Nathan's looked back to see where the referee's and gone, oh, shit, I'm out of line. It's actually here. And then in doing that, the referee hasn't seen Nathan move. Has looked back. He's gone, okay, this is where we are. Now, I, should that happen? Definitely not. I, I, I'm sure that Anderson will talk about it on Monday because referees... The, the, everyone in that team would have been devastated to, to find out that that moved so much because, uh, as you all pointed out quite clearly, it's it's an elementary thing. It's something that we do from grassroots to there. So how that fell through, they'd, they'd want to know so that they can definitely erase it because it's um, it's not a good thing. But my maybe question would be to, to you, Eamon, is as someone who has lost a final due to a foot going out, I think that was the, uh, <laughs> the one with the Dragons, mm. Was there enough yeah. in that to really get upset about, though, from a um, from a rugby league point of perspective? As punters were all like, get that right. But from a man, Melbourne perspective, do you think Melbourne fans should really be upset about that that oversight? I don't think so. I think, um, you know, if you're a Melbourne fan, you probably realise you're outplayed in that game. I, I think the right team definitely won. I, I even, you know, Craig Bellamy's conceded as much. Most of the Melbourne players have conceded as much. You know, they were... They were outplayed with a week's rest against a team that played a, a crazy game of the week before. Mm. So it makes their win even more impressive. It, should it happen? No. Should, I mean, it's not enough to blow up about because it's, you know, the, the one error. But I guess the thing that sort of percolates in your mind is I hope that, you know, that kind of error isn't made 
at a really crucial moment in the grand final. Um, so you want to make sure you're getting that stuff right. I don't think we should compare it to the 2010 grand final where you know a, a try was scored. A try, a try was scored from a foot being in touch. Clearly missed the kick. There were no actual. There was no actually Im- impact on the score from this. Exactly. You know, <laughs> Xander's clearly still hurting. Yeah. Well, I, th- I really thought I'd get that response from you, Eamon, which is why I put it in. But uh, I got it from Xander. Whichever one, I'm happy. You know, I'm just sitting in a barrel. I'm happy to get something. Um, and also, Riz has been away. For- for so long, I've been hammering with so many other things. I'm glad that he's, you know, even taking things that weren't for him. Now, speaking of losing grand finals, let's talk about the one that's coming up. I'd love to first hear uh, some predictions, and then we might do some reminiscing about old ones. And in fact, I'll, before we even do that, can I just quickly go through our tackle M nominations from last year and uh, sorry, from last week, and then line them up with how they went in real life? There was yeah. no best haircut yet in the real Daily M's, which is a real shame. But Ryan Pappenhauser did win that one uh, with 61 votes. He got 57 percent of the. Uh, of the vote, which is incredible. Uh, the other tackle M was coach of the year, and it speaks glaringly of your followers, uh, Eamon, that Robbo ended up winning that one of 43%, and Beliak got a 35%, although Beliak ended up winning it in real life. Uh, most improved player for 2021. Actually, do they have that? They don't have that as a Dalian, do they? Anyway, uh, Isaiah Papali'i did get second rower of the year, so I guess there's a kind of thing there that we got. Uh, vindicated for that. He got 65% of the votes of, of a possible 97. Wow. And then tackle M nomination for MVP went to Tommy Turbo, just like it did in real life. So we are super smart and our listeners, all 14 of them, uh, who we worked really hard for, as Mario says, did a great job with their voting. Brandon Smith, Brand, Brandon Smith got more votes than James Tedesco. What a time to be alive. Uh, either I did an incredible job of persuading people or a lot of people just jumped on that because they thought it was ridiculous. Uh, either way. No, you know what happened there, T? It's um, that poll only went out to the cheese's dealer and, and all of his dealers. So there's a little bit biased in his favour, I think, especially because he didn't grass on them when he was caught. Well, oh, and Craig Kelly still... probably voted from his 24 burners. <laughs> right, and Tom still won. Unbelievable. Uh, okay, let's start Rizzo, with you. Who do you think from this week will be your Clive Churchill winner? I have a sneaking suspicion that that, that uh, it'll be um, Adam Reynolds. He'll go out with a bang um, and uh, just have a a very strong game at seven. His last outing for Souths. It'll be a close battle, but um, I just think they'll they'll be quite primed. So I think they'll. I reckon they win in a tight one. 12-10. Zando, okay. I, say this, I say this to you as a friend. Get some self-respect <laughs> and perspective. Get yourself off you know, the ground. I'll, t- the roosters I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you why. And, and you know, this is, this is two, two weeks running. I've seen Penrith concede tries um, with uh, Dylan Edwards and either Toro just being at sixes and sevens. Um, trying to work out what to do when a fucking bomb is, is coming their way. They they conceded a, a try against um, uh, against the Yields in that fashion. It was the one try they conceded where they were just terrified of trying to catch the ball. And it happened two or three times against the Storm as well, and they were just lucky that the bounce of the ball didn't um, go against them more. I just think that South's, you know, lucky bounces was kind of, you know, they, they basically scored a, a fair chunk of their tries against the Yields from those kicks, and I think it could really be fatal. Um, and I do think that the battle in the forwards is going to be very tight. And um, it, that really concerned me going into a grand final. Mario, who do you like and, and how much do they win by? Um, I'm certainly cheering for Souths. I think it's going to be a pretty close game, but I think Penrith will be pretty stuffed more than South. South's effectively got a bit of a bye uh, against Manly. Um, I see Souths winning at 20 points to 10. I think it'll be with a, a late try to seal it. It'll be close most of the game, but they'll score last. First and last. Let's go with that for a, a you know degenerate bet of some sort. Um, I think Cleary could win the Clive Churchill even if they lose. He's a very, very strong favourite to win. I can absolutely guarantee you the Clive Churchill will not be Cody Walker. And you can, I'll let you know up to up to people to 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 guess why the um the judges might not vote for him, but you know it, it certainly could perhaps rhyme with a, a, an imaginary word like casism. Um, but if if a South player wins, I'm gonna say it's Damien Cook wins it. For anyone out there who's not sure what casism means, I will point out that Jack White did win it two years ago, and he 
would also suffer from the same amount of casism. But they love him, and he has relatively okay. white skin in comparison, <laughs> and it's appearance that matters most to racists, not facts. Uh, okay. view, views of Mario. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, um, I, I would okay. say I would say that um, you know Jack White and certainly did not deserve to win it in uh, 2018, in, in my humble opinion. And so I think if there was a, a race element, they probably would have found a whiter person at the Roosters that they could have given it to. Maybe somebody whose name uh, rhymes with Tesco. Um, mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, putting it well, out Ma- there. <laughs> Someone also called Maitrell, uh, rhyming with Maitrell, who put on the game-winning uh, play, probably also could have got it. Anyway, uh, so you're, you've you got Cleary, 2010 Rabbits, first and last try score. I love that. Uh, now, speaking of degenerate gamblers, Bizzo, what are you thinking? I'll get my score prediction first. Um, I'll look after much consideration. I've, I've sort of see Penrith winning 52 nil and um, Wayne Bennett. I can sort of see him being fired halfway through the second half in disgrace. He doesn't even make the game. At least that's how my wet dream went last night. Um, so I assume it will go pretty close to something like that. In reality, it might be a little bit closer. Um, you know, it should be a hard fought match. 50 nil. The biggest consideration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll take off a couple of points. Um, for Clive Churchill, I'll tell you, I've got who I think it will most likely be, which is Nathan Cleary, because the judges will love him. And I think Penrith will win, uh, even without my outrageous prejudice. I think they will win in a fairly tight affair. Um, but he's already come in for a bit of criticism from one of the panellists. But for me, the smoky for value, if anyone out there is betting, is Dylan Edwards. 26 to 1, who can put on a gem of a game when Penrith are on. Um, that's a that's a huge, huge odds for a fullback in the modern game. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's true. Yeah, Penrith play well and they execute. Dylan Edwards should theoretically be heavily involved in that. And if all goes to plan, he might even have a few try assists and a few tries. So he's one of those guys, you know, he can have the odd Barry, but he's, in my opinion, he's mainly good. Um, so if Penrith are good, then he might be in the hunt. Did anyone want to respond to that? It was pretty outlandish. Before I mean, just, just that. Uh, really quickly, I, I just want to commend Eamon for his restraint from for saying that uh, Bennett would be fired from his job and not out of a cannon into the sun. <laughs> <laughs> Hard and feathered. I, I want to congratulate um, um, Bizzo on getting getting all the way from that um, party with Brandon Smith on the Gold Coast to here in time to record. So. You know, you've got to the Sports Best Friends studios in such record time considering the, the lockdown and everything. Well done. Yeah, big congrats, buddy. Um, can I also congratulate you, Mario, on being able to live tweet while also recording? You are a modern-day man that you can do so many things with so many different people at the same time. Um, my <laughs> Yeah, you know how he managed to master that, see? It's um, because he can actually text with his junk. <laughs> and Mario became very adept, especially back in the days of the BlackBerry. Um, he's got a, a very, a very dexterous penis. The, the slide up, he used to slide the screen up with his balls and then start tapping with his dick. I can see that happening. Mine's got a bit of a story. Uh, Taff plays well for the first five minutes, but really sad injury, not a long term injury, just can't play the rest of the game, cork or whatever, something with his peck. Um, and it's not, it's not a big problem. We can't play. They move Cody Walker to fullback, Benji Marshall comes in at 5 8, game of his life, Clive Churchill winner, South win 21 6 as they're up 22-6 in the dying score, uh, bits and then and Marshall kicks a drop goal just to make sure that definitely cannot win. Uh, and everybody who likes rugby league cries with happiness and joy as future Hall of Famer Benji Marshall and probable immortal is uh, is crowned on his final game. Let me get this straight, biggest T. Um, <laughs> just, need to, just, need to, just need to check something. You, you as, a, as a Tigers fan, as a dyed-in-the-wool Tigers fan, We'll be supporting the side. And I know Benji's playing for them, but we'll be supporting the side that stabbed your side in the back in the famous 1909 grand final where the Tigers <laughs> had made an in principle gentleman's agreement to fight for better wages, like good working class, honest people, and saw the South Sydney Rabbitohs go out, stab them in the back and kick off to nobody and collect an unearned title. You're going to be supporting that team? Yeah, t- and a response, please. And I'm, su- and I'm not surprised you know that story because, of course, they were rallying against Rugby Union. The Wallabies were playing that day and they didn't want to, play, do the, uh, they didn't want to be the curtain raiser for that Wallaby game. Exactly. Um, 
Yeah, look, that's a really cute story, Xander. Uh, sorry, I oh, no, Xander, and um, whoever you are. It's been so long since you've been on the show, and you obviously don't listen to the show where you're not on it because we've been talking a lot about Benji Marshall um, of late in the last few episodes. That That's a really great story, and it's part of our Balmain history, and, of course, that's not the team that we are anymore, and that's not the team that Benji Marshall played for. Benji Marshall played for the West Tigers. We don't hold on to, as a Balmain fan base, we certainly like to talk about that story. West also had a lot of problematic and, uh, you know, cute rivalries, but now... We're in a new age. The West Tigers have its own history. None of it has been problematic with, with South because South have been absolutely shit the entire time that we've been playing them, except for the last couple of years. And in that time, they haven't been able to beat us particularly well. We, we've been, we have a really great record against South. The West Tigers have a really great record against South. So, no, I have no problem with Benji Marshall playing for South and doing an excellent job. South were reinstated into the comp uh, after we have been in it. So we've been in it longer than they have in this fresh new version. And, and that problem that Balmain and South have is not anything to do with Benjamin Marshall and his incredible glory that will happen to him soon. And I use that word poignantly, glory. Look, as much as I enjoyed the Brothers Grimm-esque fairy tale that uh, Big T put forward <laughs> for next week, um, I feel like it's probably best to ground this conversation back in reality. And I wanted to put this to the panel or not. Um, and, and something that I think I suffered from a bit of self-delusion over the last couple of weeks on the podcast. How dare was, you? you know, I know. It rarely happens to me, but it certainly, I mean, it must have. I, I thought Manly would win. Jesus Christ, I must have been drunk. That was so <laughs> such a depressing loss for Mario that he had to go camping in the woods to escape the scrutiny. <laughs> yeah. um, but no, look, I, I think the one factor that we have been not discussing here on the show is the fact that we all know the successful sides generally are the best defensive team. And I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Penrith Panthers have been the best defensive team all year and they've proven it in those last two matches, how good their defence can be. That is the primary reason I think they're going to win next week. Last two matches, one of them was against us that they lost. The, are they the two matches you're talking about? Your point's good on average. Yep, they were the best defensive team all year. I agree. So the, la- but, the last uh, two games were mean that you- the last two games were against the Storm and the Eels, actually. But, um, you know. Okay, sorry. The last three games. The... Um, and so they defended it well in, in all three of those games. As, uh, I agree, but they just um, that doesn't mean that they'll win. Unfortunately, I don't think. I think South are playing better across the park. Uh, you've got you're the only one who's picked Penrith. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. We're going to put a bit and, of a, um, a TBT bet on the table here. Oh, I like it. I reckon maybe a case of beer. How do we do it between four? Well, I'm sure we can work this out. But um, am, am I the only yeah, one riding Penrith out of the out of the four of us? Is that right? Yeah, we might have to do it on Clive Churchill winners. Yeah, maybe that's maybe we all put in, and if one of us gets it, then we all we all get the thing. We all get the thing back. Uh, well, I'm going to move on to nostalgic reasons, unless anybody else, Murray, you didn't have a you didn't have a swipe at my Benji Marshall Maz. Yeah, the only thing I think that you need to make the story better is that although he's not the logical person to go at fullback in the in the heat of the moment, Wayne Bennett will panic and put Benji Marshall to the fullback position. And then yeah. how amazingly well he plays there is what sways the judges towards him as the Clive Churchill medal. Mm. He used to defend as a fullback in those early days when he was the five that he defended as fullback or as wing. And in fact, that's why he's back there for that Marshall skips away. When Marshall skips away is because he's defending uh, at fullback at the time. So if that, if that happens, that could be good. We shouldn't brush past the Benji Marshall phenomenon here. I know that you've been vocal about it on Twitter, but rightly so. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I don't think it on Twitter, mate. You think if you, uh, you think okay. talking to you two has you know has been mildly problematic? Twitter is way less <laughs> kind to me about it. Anyway, yes, I have been talking about it in a lot. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Thanks for displacing the blame on our shoulders there. Um, no, I, I um I actually think you're, you're right to be talking about this story because. I, I mean, I could be, I don't know of a precedent here, but it, could Benji be the, the first person to have played in two grand finals this many years apart, 2005 and 2021? It's a, it's a huge margin. Yeah, 16 years. And that in itself is a really great story. 14 years was the last one. And I think Lottie Dakiri and another guy who played for West, would you believe? He played for Bowman and then he played for West and it was in like 1912 and then 14 years after that. <laughs> 1930. Yeah, Lottie, when he played the other one. So it must have been 1916. Lottie played what so 22,000 and um in 2014. 14, right? yeah. So they're both so yeah. the, the record before was 14. Both of them had to do with um both of the all three players have played for West or, or Balmain, um, which is incredible. And two of them are gonna play the grand finals in for South for the second, you know, which which is also just so bizarre that those three teams kept coming back around mm-hmm. and around. It sort of reminds me, it's a bit like a 
uh, like a Rocky movie or Rocky versus Rocky Six. You know, the first one where Benji was young and sleek and nobody had seen him before and he was, you know, he could step and he was really fast. But now it's sort of Rocky Six and he's old and he's all beaten up and, you know, he's now fighting some roided cunt from the Taliban. <laughs> Um, actually, in fact, actually, it's nothing like that at all. But I still enjoy the story. Uh, I think you know. I mean, if we're talking about these sorts of these sorts of feats, so I think that we can't go past the, the greatest of those stories, which is obviously Sonny Bill Williams in two thousand and four, and then nine years later coming back to the Roosters <laughs> after being Real disgraced boring. and and, and <laughs> taking taking a side that it, that had been at the bottom of the table to winning the Premiership. I think that probably goes down. You know, Eamon, you agree? The greatest <laughs> comeback of all time. In rugby you, league, you, you swayed me, Xander. Fuck Benji. Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> Sunny Bill was good. I also really liked Menzies' one, him coming back and the scoring in that grand final, 17, and he's back um, coming off the bench. And, and Luke Lewis was obviously another great story where he'd played for Penrith and then he'd won one um, with Cronulla in 2016. That was, that, I, I really like these mm. old blokes who, who are sticking around and have a real crafty rugby league brain. And that's what's keeping them there. And also, they've been lucky that their bodies haven't given out on them. Um, and T, I guess another factor I think just taking a little bit of the sheen off is the fact that he went from a likeable club um, and now he's playing for the enemy. Um, so it's a little bit disheartening for a lot of people. It's a bit like, you know, being a big fan of Barack Obama before he became a QAnon shaman or something. It's a bit unsettling, I think, for, for people. And um, if anything was going to quash the fairy tale narrative, it would be the fact he's playing for South. I mean, we just talked about a, a player who went from Canterbury to the Roosters, which would have upset them, and then another one that went from Penrith <laughs> to Cronulla. So I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of these fan bases aren't, aren't happy with the ones they end up with, but you can you can still end up loving that player. I also wanted to make a big song and dance out about Benji this week um, before the grand final because I was worried that if we all waited till after the grand final and, and Penrith do win, which is which is highly probable, we that we then might not be able to do the story. It's too hard because we're talking too much about Penrith. Whereas I wanted to make sure that him just making the grand final is, is incredible enough and. And whatever, but I really think I would love to spend some time. I think Mario earmarked that he'd really like to talk about Benji if he wins next week, which I think is really sensible because then the story has its ending and, and we can talk about you know how incredible or, or how disappointing that ending was. Right. But speaking of just just go, re- go, go. just really briefly, I, I, I mean, this just has to be said. But I, I I think for me the true end of Benji's career will always be his short stink, stint at the uh, the Auckland Blues. Um, where he was dropped after three games. I thought that was the right way for him to go out, and uh, it'll always be how I remember him. No one else will, because no one cares about rugby. Next, <laughs> I just, I just wanted to, I just wanted to stick the boot in. That's, um, look, you, you guys, you guys have to appreciate that he did make the attempt to hop over to, to another code, and um, it could have been, you know, something like Sonny Bill Williams, but um, yeah, I guess he won't have that on his resume. Uh, it won't be like Sonny Bill. But you know, it'll be something. Did Sonny Bill play in the centres? No, he played. He would have played in the front row somewhere, or somewhere in the forward pack. No, no, no. He played. He played in the centres. Oh, did he? Yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't. I didn't follow it. Uh, let's talk about. <laughs> let's talk about our favourite grand finals, and we've all been blessed with our, our respective teams being in so many grand finals that we'll try, that we'll try not to talk about the ones that our teams have been in, but we'll we'll try and look at ones that we really liked that that weren't from our team. So. Uh, Rizzo can go fuck himself at the moment, so we might start with Mario. <laughs> <laughs> Mario, which one is your one of your favorite grand finals of all time? Okay, so favorite grand final that doesn't involve my team. Should I just be really on on brand and say every time the storm have lost? No, and I was really worried we we're all going to say 2015, but no, don't. I mean, you can, no. you can say that, but there's a lot of them. 2015 was shit. It was a fucking shit grand final apart from the last couple of minutes. It was terrible. Dead set, boring grand final, and I don't understand oh. anyone who thinks otherwise. Uh, 1989 is my easy pick. <sighs> to me, that's the one that I probably enjoyed watching the most. Or 2003, I really did enjoy that. Sorry, guys, that's not a shot at you, actually. I just really, really did enjoy the 2003 grand final. How Big old are you that you can even know the 89 grand final? I'm pretty friggin' old. Yeah, fucking hell. Um, cool, good, good choices. These are really good. Damon, did you want to tell me which Balmain or West Tigers grand final <laughs> loss that you wanted to talk about? <laughs> Mate, um, I'm actually with Mario with the 2015. I mean, it was exciting, uh, but I wouldn't say it was 80 minutes of quality. I think for me, the one that I don't even think it's really talked about, but um, I thought it was a really high quality match and really tight. 
and had a, a genuine grandstand ending was 2016. This was the you know mm. the grudge match that had gone on for a couple of seasons there between the Sharks and the Storm. They were epic games. They were always dirty and bruising encounters because both teams knew how to cheat. Um, and uh, you know, they came to that grand final, and you know, there was nothing in it, obviously, apart from a few key moments. But for it to come down at the end, for what was it about a chain of about 18 passes from the Melbourne oh. Storm, just couldn't quite get the job done at the end, and the tremendous defence uh, that Sharks showed in the in the dying stages to get that, and of course, it was their first and only premiership, which only added to you know that that moment, that theatre. Um, I love that grand final. I love Andrew Fafita in that final, actually. Uh, such a mercurial player. Yeah. He's, he's polarizing. I get that. But, you know, he was the Clive Churchill winner, but not not officially, but he clearly was the best player on the field that day. Um, and that that try where he just carried five people over to to clinch the game was amazing. Um, there were so many key moments in it. I love that match. Watched it back a couple of times. And interestingly, in, in terms of post-mortems for that match, I'd actually heard Luke Lewis talk about um, that match. I can't remember. It was on someone's podcast. I don't know if it was even on yours, T. I can't remember who was chatting with him, but he was talking about how often the Sharks had trained for that very moment during the year uh, under another polarising coach, Flanagan. That came to the fore in the dying moments. Apparently they would do things like, you know, five on seven or five on nine a lot. Like they trained for that moment knowing that... It was probably not. They were probably not the type of team that were going to run away with the premiership. They didn't. They weren't that type of team that won by forty a lot. Um, you know, they they won a lot of close matches that Shark side in twenty sixteen. And you know, when you're going, if you're going to beat the Melbourne Storm in the grand final, you're probably not going to be doing it thirteen plus. So I think they saw that scenario coming, and the fact that they trained for it and they'd executed it and they put everything in. Yeah, I love that. I love that game. That was mine. Oh, well, look, um, as you said, there's just so many risks this final to, to choose from. Um, and in all, in all honesty, um, I, I will choose one of ours just because I, I enjoyed it so much. And Murray, you're going to hate me, but it is the 2013 grand final just because it was such a seesawing match that, you know, um, the Eagles were just like all over us early on in that game. And it was just a classic game of two halves where the Roosters came back, leveled up and then just took control in the, in the last quarter of the match and, the final try being that freak attempt by Jennings to get the ball down within a millimeter of the try line. It just, it was a game that just had absolutely everything in the, in, including, uh, you know, a lifelong trauma to David Williams, which I believe we, we still have, <laughs> haven't seen him resurface. It had an 11 1 penalty go on a counts. Tour, it had so forward pa- two tries of forward <laughs> passes. Yeah, it had everything all right. Yeah, this is a good one to use. Thanks. Riz, do you have one that's not a Roosters one? I actually really loved the the 91 grand final um, as a kid. I always remember that one um, just because, yeah, like the the way Penrith had come back and and some of the freak occurrences in that. I rewatched it um, on YouTube a couple of years ago and just, you know, some of the, some of the, it was a very tight, fought and close game, but um, uh, some of the tries in that game were just like freak luck occurrences. I would be tempted to, um, uh, to list 2015 just because um, uh, it was, it just gave me no end of joy to watch, uh, Darius Boyd scream into the ether, oh no, as the final trial was <laughs> um, But uh, uh, in all honesty, uh, I'd probably go for the 2005 grand final uh, oh, with Benji Marshall and, and the flick bar. No, I, I, that that was an absolutely cracking grand yeah. final for a neutral. It just felt like such an outlier year in so many ways. Mm. Like that Tigers team was just not, it was an atypical side, wasn't it, that that just swept the competition this one year. And they played this, um, uh, really a bunch of young guys and just played this different style, this weirdly, like the forwards were really mobile and light and skillful. And you had these crazy young kids on the back of it and they won by the length of the straight, really. It's, it, in terms of grand finals, the Cowboys were never in it, but it was so enjoyable nonetheless. It was an interesting year too, because it had come on the back end of an era where defensive dominated the game. And I remember, I can remember the discussions around the game at the time, the defence was stifling and killing the creativity out of the game. And, and as you say, the, the Tigers just came out of nowhere and they were scoring points like nothing else and, and they just couldn't be stopped. And, yeah, it was just – it was it was an exhilarating uh, final. As you say, I mean, the, the Cowboys, you know, wilted away in the end, but it was it was just such an iconic match. Yeah. And I, th- I remember the same conversations about, well, the game's changed now. This is the new template. 
and didn't. <laughs> it went straight back into some some pretty cynical footy, it felt like anyway, um, in 2006, and it was a little bit more argy-bargy again, but it was just this breath of fresh air, and then it disappeared. It was bizarre. Mario, was there anything that you would like to say about how great 2005 was? Um, no, because it... Along with oh. 2012, it's the only grand final I haven't seen since 1986. Yeah, wow. Um, they they are on the internet. internet. How did you manage to have seen the 2005 one in 1986? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, was, so I was living in London in 2005 and had been dragged along to watch the bloody AFL grand final and had to pay for entry and I and – I just had absolutely no energy left to watch the NRL the next week because I hadn't watched the game all year anyway because I'd been living overseas and just never ended up watching. Couldn't get anyone to go with me. I would have gone, but, yeah, no one was going with me, so I didn't do it. Still not sure how that maps up the time travel, but it's interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, I can can tell you I had had a real fun time. Um, I think it was maybe the last lockdown where most nights I stayed up and watched a bunch of grand finals because they have them all on the NRL website. No, and not if you go on the app, but if you go on the actual website, we've got a huge amount of old games there and every single grand final since into the 70s. So it's actually, in fact, it might even have the the Bowman one in 169 in a kind of weird highlighted way, but that's a fantastic way to catch up on them all, which is why I felt quite confident talking about them because I also couldn't be sure which ones I'd seen or hadn't seen or which one I've now just remembering people talk about. And so what going back and watching them all was fantastic. The first one I went to was in 1999 that I like physically went to, and that was ended up being an incredible grand finals. Melbourne's first one. Um, obviously the dragons had been in a bunch that, that decade and hadn't won anything yet. I remember going and, and feeling like I had to support St. George because they were the Sydney team. And my dad giving me a lot of shit about that because he was just like, Melbourne's been a better team all year. This I, I fuck St. George. And, and watching that whole thing play out, Blacklock's try live was incredible. And that seeing the video referee award a try, like that was probably the first time in my memory that I can remember, like the video referee making such a big decision that essentially chose a game. And now, you know, it happens every other game. But that was, that was incredible. And the Tigers were in the uh, in the reserve grade grand final and lost beforehand uh, on that day. Uh, I... I was at a Bucks for the 2014. In fact, I was at a Bucks every single grand final from 2009 to 2014. It was an incredible um, purple wow. patch for my friends getting married. And I felt like we were doing it deliberately just to keep going away on boxes for the grand finals. Uh, and the 2014 one was a great Bucks and, and it was a great grand final during during that time. The 2016 one was also a great one for me because it was the first one I didn't watch live for, well, I'll just say since 1986, just to go with Mario. And <laughs> I was in an aeroplane going to, going to an incredible road trip around um, America, and when we took off, they they told us that the grand final had started or, or was in play or something like that. And then just halfway through the flight, people were asleep or whatever, and it just came over the the PA that I just want to know that the Cronulla Sharks had just won the grand final, and the plane went nuts. Everyone on the plane was so yeah. excited for them; they finally won. And it took me months to finally watch the game because by the time I got back, no one cared, and and you know I didn't think about it. I just I saw some of the highlights. Um, but that was incredible. But my favourite one, which only happened from when I went back and watched them and had been listening to a thousand podcasts, was the 2013 one as well. And I'm so sorry, Nazo. But from that, I heard I heard a podcast that had Minicello in it. He talked about how it was it was Trent Robinson's first year, and one of the first things he said in um, in pre season training was, "You guys are a shit second half team. I've been watching you for a long time. You're a shit second half team. That's what we're going to fix." And so all year they did all these drills about being absolutely gassed, running and doing all this stupid stuff, and, and doing drills at 100. percent And then they would have a half time where they would have the same amount of time you would have at half time, and they'd go, "That's it." And then they'd go back into even harder drills to try and go into a every, everyone had to go 110 percent. Now that you know that we're in the second half. Do you know what I mean? So everyone, even in training, talked about this is the second half. You've had a 10-minute break. This is your second half. We go harder. We go harder. And then they found themselves in the end goal down by however much it was, six or eight points. And Minicello was in the end goal saying to them, this is incredible. We've trained for this exact moment our entire year. Trent Robinson was right. We know exactly how to do this. Manly aren't prepared. We're the only team prepared in the entire comp for this. We're the only team that can come back in the second half in a grand final, and we're going to do it. And then they did it. And it was just – I'd watched that game – had forgotten. I just hated it immediately because it was Roosters and Manly and forgot actually watching it. And then when watching it back, loved it. Listen, the podcast was so inspired. Got chills listening to Mini talk about it. Went back and watched it again. Was even more impressed um, by how incredible the entire game was. And that was 
despite the people you know who just you know had won enough grand finals in my brain by that stage, uh, it was still just an incredible game of football. And and taken out of context, without everyone winning all the time around them, um, it was just a great game of football and great that it had that kind of uh, grand final gravitas uh, at the end to, uh, as well. And that was the same year. I'm pretty sure I'm not misremembering this. Where we met mainly in that 4-0 game early in the finals, yeah. which was oh, yeah. the most enthralling 4-0 games you'll ever watch. So there was a there was already a history between the two clubs that year. I think we ended up, uh, sorry, Murray, I'm not doing this on purpose, beating you some record amount of times in that four year. Time, but were, four times. Four, four times. Yeah. But yeah. they were all good games. That, that, that was the irony is that I don't remember a game feeling as though that was a foregone conclusion. They were always in the balance. It just happened to fall our way. Well, that's all the time we've got for you this evening, Tacklers. Gentlemen, anything else before we um, hustle away? I did want to talk about something that has occurred on the um, Dally M's this evening, which I thought was a bit strange. No, I don't need to talk about PVL being incapable of pronouncing surnames or first names tonight, which which I've been reading about. <laughs> but the um, interesting one was, as you guys may recall, they had the short list for each position of the year, the five or four players that were eligible for each position. Now, what in the centres, I don't recall who was eligible, but one of them was not Justin Olam, who has then won centre of the year. What the fuck's happening it there? It was an back to it, Murray. Yeah. Because he wasn't even invited originally, I didn't think. That was the big scandal, right? He wasn't even invited. Yeah. And I mean, he should have been in that shortlist. There's no doubt that's an oversight. But for him sure. to be as a late inclusion in it seems a bit cynical to me. I don't know. In the Team of the Year nominations 2021 that they posted um, yesterday, it does have Matt Burton, Joseph Manu, Bradman Best, Justin Olam, and Dan Gagai. And, everyone, and I know that because Bradman Best was everyone lulled so hard about Bradman Best being in there. Um, so I don't know if that fixes the issue you're talking about or if it confuses it even more but is that right that there's not normally five isn't it normally four so they've just added him as a fifth is that right so there's there was four in some categories the halfback and five eight had four but the props uh centers fullbacks had five hooker second second row had four yeah Yeah, hookers had four um i don't know and i don't really know that this was a different system again it actually wasn't done by our deli and votes who's up the top like it has been in the past they've changed how it was done so they put this nominations in and then it's unclear how these people got um the points that the, the awards that they did they just well yeah so well it, given it's just, uh, given that um mitch Kikau has got mitch back sent second row of the year and he was not in the top 10 best second rowers this year is an interesting one sorry to interrupt no 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 you, you're right and but also yeah uh mitch um mitch doyle uh, is incredible in his study and criticisms of Dalian, which is where I'm getting a lot of my information about this from tonight. So if I'm being unclear or you want to know more about it, go and find um, Mitch Geo because he's he's incredible and uh, with his knowledge about this kind of stuff and, and um, worth a follow if you're keen for some ranting, some insightful but uh, well-worded ranting. Um, well, until next time. Just do what Fox League News would do. Pretend DC has a chance of winning the Delhi M by claiming he's as clutch as Jordan, Kobe, or August Ames, who all get their shot away in the final seconds. Thanks, tacklers, and farewell for the week.